So we'll start with uh, the foundation of all good qualities. <clears throat> so as we do the foundation of all good qualities, really sit with the meaning. Um, I'll pause after each verse and try and just connect your mind with your understanding of it so far. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correct devotion to them is the root of the path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon them with great respect. Understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is greatly meaningful and is difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly, day and night, takes its essence. This life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativities and accomplish all virtuous deeds. Seeking samsaric pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Led by this pure thought, mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. The root of the teachings is keeping the Pratamoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so have all mother migratory beings. Please bless me to see this, train in supreme bodhicitta, and bear the responsibility of freeing migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but I don't practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, Please bless me to practice the bodhisattva vows with great energy. Once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general path, Please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme Vajra vehicle. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping pure vows in Samaya. As I have become firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and pledges like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy, never giving up the four sessions, please bless me to realize the teachings of the Holy Guru. Like that, may the gurus who show the noble path and the spiritual friends who practice it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By completing the qualities of the stages and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajadhara. So just let your mind connect with the whole path to enlightenment. So last time, um, there was a guided meditation on the foundation of all good qualities. Um, a lot of people use this in their daily practice. And um, there's the extensive way and there's the abbreviated way. So the extensive way would be to read a verse and then think deeply and specifically about the content of that verse and kind of feel the resonance of its in meaning within you and then move on to the next, do the same thing, move on to the next, do the same thing. Another approach, um, which sometimes can be more engaging or more lively 
is to focus your practice around just one verse and really drill down deeply into one and then do the rest in an abbreviated way. So you say them, you're reinforcing them, you're keeping the whole picture in your mind, but you're only really drilling down into one. And you do that same one for a long time until it feels kind of like, yep, I've made friends with that verse. And then you shift and emphasize a different one. So use of prayers like this in daily practice is a very common thing in Tibetan Buddhism. You know, you don't need to use this one, but it's very recommended to use a Lam Rim prayer or a Lojong prayer. So a prayer related to the whole path to enlightenment sequentially hitting the main topics or a Lojong thought transformation prayer like the Wheel of Sharp Weapons or the Eight Verses of Thought Transformation or the Seven Point Mind Training, one of those texts, which is the radical reframing of the suffering in your life. So it's useful to use a motivation in the morning, we know that, um, just thinking bodhicitta, 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 and get out of bed. Excellent, if you do only that, that's really an excellent way to start. But sometimes using prayers like this um, can really help, I guess, kind of give you a scaffolding or something to hang on to that builds continuity day after day, year after year. So, um, so just kind of have a think about maybe weaving in one of these Lam Rim prayers or one of the Lojong prayers into your daily practice, because the repetition really does build depth. So how did it go to do a meditation using a prayer last time? Did you connect to that way or was it kind of clunky and I don't know, less smooth or was it kind of easier to stay focused? How did it go for you to meditate on the foundation of all good qualities as an analytical meditation? I wanted to, to share a feeling that uh, it's beginning for me to be more difficult to, to meditate through Zoom. And I know that the rest of the semester will be with you in Zoom because you cannot be in Israel now. And I wanted to ask maybe for your help or antidotes for this because I feel it's, it's um, more difficult to learn the Buddhism long time through Zoom and the meditation. So... Um, do you think that the difficulty is kind of the aloneness and the technology and that it might be easier once you guys can be together at least with each other? Or is there something else about the Zoom do you think that makes it difficult? Kind of what's what do you think is the main obstacle? I hope that when we will be in the Gompa and be together it will be easier but even the presence of the presence of you the leading uh, uh, person, the energy, the I, I feel it's difficult to learn it and to be more uh, in, a, in direct, some direct perception. It's 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 more intellectual than before, and it's difficult for me. And I think because of the topics are being more and more difficult to to understand. Uh, so I don't know how to um, work with this difficulty. Yeah. I guess the only thing I can say is just personally what I feel useful is to stop expecting experiential connection with the meditation and hear it more as training myself how to do it by myself later. So I listen for the instructions of, okay, first he does this, and then he seems to pause for this amount of time, and then the shift happens here, and then I do it by myself and I have experience. But a lot of the time, just because of the nature of Zoom and technology and my own, you know, preconceptions about screens and whatever, it is hard to feel that same kind of group energy and meditative energy. It is. It's really hard. And I think for me, it's just easier if I stop expecting that to happen. And sometimes it does. And that's a great bonus. And I'm so happy when there's that feeling of connection. But if I let go of the expectation of it and the like nostalgia for it then I still feel like it's a worthwhile experience because I'm hearing it in terms of this is what I'll do when I'm by myself on my cushion. So I'm just learning instructions. Yeah, I'm learning, you know, step one, step two, step three. And in a way, it's 
more empowering because you're hearing, okay, he says it this way. I understand what he means. I'm going to frame that same concept into these words for myself so that it resonates when I do it alone. You know, so in a way it kind of gives you the power to yourself of how am I going to do this all by myself? Because there will be lots of periods in my life where I just won't have regular access to teachings through circumstance or through whatever reason. So, um, that's one way. Stop expecting experience and just hear it as instructions that you'll use later. And then later you'll have experience. I, I'm looking forward to how it will be when you guys are together with each other. I teach a few other groups and when they are with each other, it's much easier for me to feel the group connection. And even if there's like five or six people who aren't in the room, if there's a big group and then a few individuals, it's kind of easier to feel a group energy. So like the center in the Blue Mountains has like a gompa cam. And so, you know, I can see everybody in the gompa and then they have my little TV screen kind of up by the altar. And it feels actually really similar um, because enough people are together. So I don't know if that's just psychological in my own projection or the fact that they have group energy has kind of an expanding effect on the process. I don't know, but it certainly feels a lot easier and it feels a lot more like how it used to be when we were all together. So look forward to that, I guess, too. <laughs> yeah. Do, do other people have, have thoughts about what's kind of helped them unblock themselves from Zoom fatigue? especially related to meditation any tips or techniques that have kind of helped you um, i i think it's, it's not only uh, a zoom fatigue it's uh, different things together i mean approaching beyond the end and all of the hesitation or thinking concerning the 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 a continuation of the practice, uh, tackling the the sub the topic of guru devotion. It's it's a serious stuff. Uh, uh, keeping uh, uh, keeping uh, practicing, uh, keeping a kind of continuity in the practice in a daily basis. Yeah, it's all together me the thing that helps all of this is just keep showing up you know keep showing up to your cushion keep showing up to your texts keep showing up to any kind of dharma class that you have time and energy to engage with keep showing up but without expectations and pressure on yourself just you know time goes by and there are you know chapters in your life where you get more immediate engagement with your practice from your teachers and times when you have almost none. And what keeps you going is to just like from your own side, participate, <laughs> you know, you have to participate in your own practice to be effective. And that doesn't mean you have to verbally communicate anything in particular, though, of course, that would make class easier, you know, hint, hint. But um, even if you don't do that, if, if there's an active inner conversation, if it's passive, you're just going to stagnate, you know? So, so act, actively ask your questions to yourself about how can I use this topic in my life? Is it useful to use this topic in my life? Other people who use it, what's the advantage in theirs? And you can take it or leave it, but really engage with it deeply and see if there's something you can extract from it. Yeah. Um, it's, look, I know we're tired, right? It's been a long time of, of not being together and that's really, it's hard. Um, there was six years where I didn't get to see my teacher almost at all. He was asked to be um, the abbot of Gume Tantra College and he just had to be the full-time abbot of a giant tantric university. And so for six years, I saw him for like a day, once a year, you know, sometimes a couple of days. I think I had one brief phone call. <laughs> And it was really, it was hard because I'd had like seven years straight of seeing him every single day for most of the day. And, you know, it's like I was a baby bird being kicked out of the nest, you know, and sometimes I was flying and sometimes I was falling on my head. And 
then he came back and I realized that I grew up a bit and that was actually really satisfying. It's like he, he taught me everything I need. I just need to go back over it now and keep going back over it and keep going back over it. And it becomes more and more my own. And that's kind of a deeply satisfying feeling. So, I mean, the next topic does tie into all of this a lot. This, the next topic we're doing is perfect human rebirth. And in Buddhism, this is seen as your cure for depression, which, you know, a lot of people object to that as um, gonna work for us, you know, be objective and just kind of see how it lands. But the concept is kind of a basic gratitude reflection that we have it incredibly well. And it's so hard for us to do this if we were brought up with any kind of like any Western culture socialization or, you know, because if we hear, here's all the ways you have it good, together with that is often a lot of guilt, you know, and like I should be doing more given how much I have. Or there's jealousy and pride and comparison of, okay, I have it good, but look at all these people who are not even good people. They're terrible people and they have all these more resources than me and I don't really have it good at all. And you get into a deprivation mentality. So try to hear this teaching on perfect human rebirth with like fresh ears, you know, hear it as just a raw, how incredibly fortunate we are teaching to uplift your mind. And if you feel yourself going, yeah, but I don't have it that good, or I have it so good and I'm so terrible because I don't use it. If you hear that background conversation start to bubble up, just consciously say, not now. We can revisit that old conditioning if it's necessary. Let's hear it freshly and see what impact it has on our mind if we look at it freshly. So if you say to a Tibetan Lama, I'm feeling very depressed, they will say, meditate on perfect human rebirth. And then the depressed person will grumble and be like, what good's that going to do? That sounds like my mother telling me to eat all my vegetables because there are starving children in Africa. What good is that going to do? I'm just going to feel guilty. Ugh, Tibetans. Yeah. It's a normal response if that's how you hear it. Um, see how it goes if you hear it really fresh, okay? Really, really fresh. So I'll just keeping us organized. We're still in the preliminaries of the Lam Rim. So correctly relying on a spiritual friend, looking at the characteristics of a reliable student, how to meditate and how to act in between sessions. Now we're into perfect human rebirth. And the goal here is to make this life meaningful by pursuing a spiritual path. So meaningful in the sense of deeply content not necessarily excited, happy, not bouncing up and down, but just a joyful, deep contentment that you found correct priorities, that you found sustainable ethics that can be grown and deepened and how really rare it is for people to find any kind of framework or structure where they can move forward into their fullest potential. So it's, it's an incredibly fortunate situation we're in and just try and see if we can kind of connect with that. So in practicing the path, the next topic, this is on page 80, if you've got your hard copy or 81, the next topic is how to train and taking the essence of our perfect human rebirth. Within th in this topic, there are two main parts, recognizing the perfect human rebirth and understanding its great value and rarity. Generally speaking, we waste away our lives because we fail to recognize the opportunity, the value and the rarity of our human rebirth. The more we reflect on the great value of our perfect human rebirth, the less we will be inclined to squander the occasion. We won't waste it. The more we will be inclined to take our spiritual practice to heart a perfect human rebirth is endowed with two unique sets of privileges, the leisures and the opportunities. Leisures refers to the eight states of freedom from being unable to develop our minds through Dharma practice and opportunities refers to the good conditions that we have to do so. 
So you're kind of sitting with the fact of, okay, what do I have? What's in my life that's good? You know, you have housing, you have food, you have family, you have enough health for independence. Yeah. And actually having enough health to be relatively independent is very temporary and very fragile and just so incredibly precious just to be able to walk from one side of the room to the other whenever you want to, to be able to pick up a book and read it and be able to, is actually just like a miracle. <laughs> and we can tie in the reflection on perfect human rebirth with reflections on impermanence and death very naturally. They go together very well. If you're thinking about everything that you have right now and it feels like not enough, imagine if it was taken from you. You know, imagine if suddenly you had to live in a tent and suddenly all you had to eat were ramen noodles and suddenly there was no easy transportation and you sprained your ankle, <laughs> you know, just that, how much harder it would be to engage with spiritual practice, how much harder it would be to think of others and how you could benefit them. You know, so it's like, it feels like I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I'm not good enough. This isn't good enough. Nothing is good enough until you think what you have going. And suddenly you're like, oh my goodness, this is so precious. So the rareness, it doesn't feel rare if you're surrounded by people with similar circumstances. You know, these studies that they've done about poverty, when they're asking, does money give you happiness? And the studies show <laughs> that sort of money gives you happiness, sort of. If you have enough to live on, but more importantly is, are you of a similar status to your neighbors? So you feel happy with your resources if your resources are similar to the people around you. If they seem less than the people around you, then it doesn't feel like enough, even if objectively it is enough. So if we were all in tents, it would feel very different than if just one of us was. And maybe if all of us were living in tents, we'd kind of be like, all right, let's make it an adventure. This is really inconvenient, but maybe it will be fun too. And we'd like, you know, I don't know, make a circle and have a party and do a bonfire and it'd be great. You know, but if you're the only one, you start to feel really deprived. Yeah. And, you know, think about it when you go on vacation how ridiculous it is, it is for us in a way that we go on vacation and go stay in a hotel room, which is smaller than our house. You know, we have a whole house, many, many rooms, maybe more than one bathroom. So exciting, right? A yard. <laughs> but then we think it's such a relief. Oh, I'm on holiday in one tiny room with your whole family, like, and you can't get away from each other. Like, it sounds like torture, not a holiday, but because it's different, it kind of gives that life and that freshness to it. So we just kind of want to play with what is our relationship to our circumstances and how much are we telling ourselves what the ingredients for happiness are rather than experiencing the fact that we're incredibly abundant filled, right? We have this amazing abundance and our current access to resources is something that most of the world doesn't have. Yeah. So it seems like most of us here together, we have similar resources. But if you look in terms of the world, actually, we're the lucky ones. And maybe resource wise, in terms of like physical resources, it's not so dramatically better. But in terms of access to teachings, and access to knowledge, and access to support, and like a tolerance for whatever we want to pursue. This is also pretty unique. So say you love Buddhism and you love psychoanalysis and you're so curious about both of them, but now suddenly you live in a country where something about you means you're not allowed to be educated. So you have this hunger for knowledge, but no access. Because this is true, isn't it? In lots of parts of the world, there are people that are very curious, interested, motivated, but there's just no access. And you think, oh, what, what about the internet? 
yeah, well, some some countries have pretty elaborate firewalls and pretty, you know, heavy duty propaganda machines and filtration systems. That means that they don't actually have infinite access to any information. So by thinking about what we have and what others don't have, we're not trying to get into a comparison of I'm the good one, they're the bad one, or I'm the superior one and they're the lesser one. You're seeing that it's a pretty unique thing for things to come together like this. And you happen to be one of the ones experiencing that. So if you're one of the ones experiencing that boon of resources, that kind of makes it your responsibility to use it. Yeah. So we'll just dig in a little bit more here. So here we go into um, the stimulus to take the essence from your optimum human rebirth. Okay, so the freedoms were free from being in one of these four non-human states where there's no chance for Dharma study. And so there are life forms experiencing continual pain and fear. So we could call this hell realms. We could say literally Buddhist hell realms, hot ones, cold ones, adjoining ones, all the multiple kinds of hell realms. But you could also just say a human life with continual pain and fear, there is no freedom for study. And then there are life forms experiencing continual frustration and clinging. And we could call these hungry ghost realms. We could call these predator realms. But in terms of the human realm, there are people in our life right now who we know have all sorts of resources, but they're so used to being frustrated. They're so used to grasping and clinging. You know, it's like their whole life is about complaints and craving. And when your mind gets into that kind of pattern, you close off all the chances to study and pursue anything else. So while we do have pain and fear, while we do have frustration and clinging, it's not like the dominant thing in our everyday life. It's not our wake up and this is what happens the second we are awake. This comes and goes. These are like peak scary moments in our life as opposed to our daily life experience. And that is a rare thing and an incredibly fortunate thing that we have that freedom. So then animals, of course, their lives are dominated by ignorance in particular, like ignorance of their own mortality or ignorance of a certain type of interdependence, um, a lot of fear and craving in an animal realm. And so even if you're a very intelligent animal, even if you're an animal, maybe a mammal of some kind, maybe even a whale, there's still not the same ability to pursue new knowledge and depth of understanding. And if you think about the creatures you can actually see besides human beings, we see animals and there are probably three times as many animals under our house right now as there are human beings. So, so many more consciousnesses are reborn in an animal realm than are reborn in a human realm, just percentage wise. And then celestial beings, uh, heavenly beings, these are people that have it good, right? So whether it's literally the God and demigod realm, or it's the human realm, people that have such an abundance of material ease, and such an abundance of like worldly success and reputation, that they become drunk with pleasure and completely forget everyone else. So th this can be an interesting one to unpack, because a lot of, you know, the modern world is trying to get wealth, gather wealth, have some sort of stability with wealth. And then think about people that are in, you know, the 1%, people that are, you know, like billionaire billionaires. And how much the, the pervasive theme with people who are billionaires is their disregard for the needs of others. You know, there maybe are some billionaires who do a charitable activity every once in a while and have a foundation over here. But generally speaking, they just hoard, you know? And they might have businesses with thousands of workers who they pay minimum wage, even though they could afford to pay them twice as much and their quality of life wouldn't even change. But, you know, like think of Amazon as a, co a corporation, right? It's, it's like 
fantastically wealthy person at the head of it, he could do so much good in the world and it would not affect his daily life at all. He would not suffer at all if he did more for his workers. But because he's so drunk with pleasure and so habituated to hoarding wealth, I'm guessing it doesn't even occur to him how much suffering he's involved in. Probably if he met a family suffering because of the incredibly low wages and terrible work conditions at Amazon factories, if he saw someone and met someone and had to live with them for a month, his heart would probably open. It's not like he's evil. It's just so far removed from the everyday experience that there's like no pathways of empathy or affinity. So if you're feeling like you're lacking abundance and you're lacking wealth and resources and you feel like part of you works, yes, to benefit sentient beings, but also to accumulate some sort of wealth and status, remember what that actually does to us when we get it. It's not actually a good thing. The best of us with tons of wealth would start to lose some of our compassion. It's just human nature. We would start to lose our compassion the further we get from the lived experiences of people with really raw everyday suffering. Yeah, you have to be so well habituated to compassion, to keep compassion when everything is perfect for you. When you have perfect health, when everyone loves you, when your resources are abundant and you still have youth and beauty. To maintain compassionate from that perspective, really a rare person. So we're free from excessive wealth. It's a really important framing, I think. Yeah, to really sit with, oh, how wonderful it is. I don't have too much money, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it's a strange way of thinking, but it's important. Milton, but it, it's uh, so uh, distorted, the exposition of the stuff. Excuse me for interventing. I mean, I don't know Jeff Bezos, and I don't know if he has the bad intentions, and, um, but I know that he did something huge for this world, like, for example, uh, Steve Jobs. That I don't know if he's connecting people or making people because everybody sits with the iPhone, but people are in contact in a different way. And I think it's so... Uh, limited and distorted to examine this just from the point of view uh, if he's compassionate or not. I don't know, maybe he's doing very a lot of evil, but maybe he's giving a lot of, uh, how you say, earning money for people for living in a un subdeveloped countries. I'm not sure, but I think when we, if we want to look at things seriously, we can't uh, distort them in such a way. Well, I think if you do a little Google search after this, you'll you'll come around to my view of Jeff Bezos. But um, re re unrelated to the individual, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we think we'll be happier and more compassionate with more wealth and resources, when in fact, that's often not the case. Just like when things are going very well for us, we usually just kind of get lazy and relax into it. We don't think, oh good, now's my opportunity to practice Dharma more deeply now that I'm so happy and relaxed. Usually it's when things are really in crisis that it occurs to us, I need to upgrade my practice. I need to meditate more. I need to study more deeply because I'm really suffering right now and the techniques I've developed so far aren't working or aren't working well enough. We tell ourselves a lie. We say, if I have more, I'll do more. And that is sometimes true, but usually briefly. And then we just get swept up into indulgences and we forget about sentient beings. Look, you don't have to agree with me, right? Just sit with it, see if it's been true in your life. When things are at their very best, sometimes there's this beautiful urge to share and then it wears off <laughs> and then you don't notice how much other people are struggling around you. Or when people are struggling around you, there's a disconnect where you ask, you're sort of asking them in the back of your mind, how did you get yourself into that? You're so stupid. If you just did this and this and this, you could avoid all of that stress. Ugh, I don't understand why you suffer like that. Forgetting what it was like to be there yourself. You know, it happens to all of us. We just have to make it personal and, and think about when. Yeah, so, so the point of all this is to be motivated to practice by seeing that a perfect human rebirth 
has suffering, but not too much, has pleasure, but not too much. Because too much of either distracts us. Yeah, so use whatever example works for you, but, but really sit with that fact. Too much suffering is distracting, too much pleasure is distracting. We are in a very good situation where we have not too much of either. Yeah. And if we are starting to, you know, experience a lot more chaos than usual and pain than usual, or if we're starting to experience a lot more, I don't know, happiness, stability, resources, whatever, to kind of key back into, it's temporary. Yeah. So if things are better than usual, I really got to use it because death is coming. The death of my loved ones is coming. My own health is declining, et cetera, et cetera. So now is the time instead of saying, oh, good, now I've earned my reward from having worked hard. It's like your, your reward is to get to practice. Yeah, we, we do this to ourselves in a million different ways in a life where we say, I've been working hard all day. The reward I will give myself is to just watch the TV for however for many hours or read this nonsense or do this nonsense or drink or whatever. And it's like we tell ourselves that these indulgences are a reward. If we just said what they are, which is, I was concentrating for a long time and now I need a rest then have a rest, do a healthy rest, so you can continue with the spiritual practice. But if you're gonna frame things in terms of quote reward, which is probably not a great framework, but just kind of think about it, it's all of the positive actions you've done in your lifetimes have meant that you have resources now to go deeper. You know, that's the amazing opportunity that's opened up to us from all of our hard work. So if we're just using all of our karma, all of our good karma to just use it up and not pay it forward, we're going to miss out on all of the amazing opportunities in front of us right now. Allow yourself to feel confronted and uncomfortable and then keep going, okay? So there are four human situations then, specifically human situations with no chance for Dharma study. They usually say a barbarian, which is kind of a funny old fashioned word or uncivilized savages, which can have a really negative connotation. But what it's saying is religion is outlawed or the ability to pursue the ethical disciplines that you like is not accessible. Um, we're free from that, right? And we're also in a human situation where the Buddha's teachings um, aren't unavailable. They are available. We're free from being there in a time when a Buddha hasn't appeared and taught. And we don't have mental and physical disabilities that prevent independence or, or instinctive wrong views or learned wrong views. So wrong views like uh, regarding cause and effect, for example. Okay, so then the endowments, the things that we do have are very related. So related to ourselves, we're a human, we live in a Buddhist region, meaning we have access to Buddhism or any kind of Dharma. We're complete and healthy sense and mental faculties. This is really key because this is very temporary, you know, aging is happening. And we've not committed any of the five heinous actions and the five heinous actions are things that are so negative that it's pretty much guaranteed that your next life will be in the lower realms unless you do a really powerful action of purification. Um, so one of the five heinous actions, for example, would be like to kill your mother or father, to kill your parents is one of the heaviest negative karmas because they gave you the great kindness of your body. Um, you know, another one would be to split a community intentionally, to split a religious community intentionally. This is technically during the Buddha's time splitting the Sangha. But if you, you know, are you, are you an instrument of divisiveness, making two communities at war with each other or not like each other or separate into factions? Um, that's a very powerful misdeed. So those sorts of things. So we haven't done something so heavy that our next life is gonna just be a suffering life. Um, 
you know, of course, everything can be purified. Um, Milarepa was a serial killer, and he wound up getting enlightened in that life. So it's not like even if you do the worst things, you can't purify it, but it's going to take a, a massive effort. And then we have an instinctive belief or like a habitual belief or karmic imprints in things worthy of respect. So the Dharma, the value of ethics, the path to enlightenment. And then related to the people around us, we live where and when a Buddha has appeared, has taught, the Dharma still exists. But very importantly is there is a Sangha community following the Buddha's teachings. And there is people with loving concern like patrons and benefactors and teachers. So we have the conditions to practice. So these two, especially for beginners, are key. And, you know, for the community to exist in its traditional way, you know, you have male practitioners and female practitioners in a lay community, you have fully ordained monks and you have fully ordained nuns. And so if you have the fourfold Sangha complete, that's kind of the, the best of the best. And so, of course, in Israel, it's hard to get um, the fourfold Sangha assembled. But in terms of the greater community, that's something that does exist and is incredibly powerful. So if you're just sitting with either of those lists or a list you're making yourself of all of the amazing things you both have and are free from, how does it land? And then can I ask something about it? Yeah. Um, when I read the list, uh, the one item that that was a real worry for, <laughs> for me personally was the one about... Uh, um being born or raised i think it was being born with the tendencies of uh disbelief in some kind of an important aspect of the dharma could you explain a little bit about it or maybe mm -hmm. reassuring me a bit it's well it's it's basically um we are we were brought up in such a way that the ethics of non-harmfulness makes sense to us you know, so even if it's not specifically Buddhist ethics, the whole concept of living for oneself alone is not a good idea to us. There's something in us that is already altruistic. You know, if we were to just kind of um, think that stealing is fine if you can get away with it, or if you were to say to yourself, whatever it takes if it's for just my family. You know, if we had those kind of instinctual beliefs, that would make spiritual practice harder. But even before you met Dharma, you thought altruism is important, the greater good's important, working for the good of humanity and society as a whole is important. Of course, I need to look after myself and my family, but it's all interconnected. That already made sense to you, right? Yeah, but not, I think, maybe it's a mistake, but uh, I think, but uh, yeah, it is instinctual kind of instinctual or it's already in us but i don't think it's it has something to do with the cause and effect uh, nature of things well i mean even if you don't use the words karma there was kind of probably an idea that positive actions that are beneficial to others lead to greater happiness and negative destructive actions generally lead to suffering. That belief in cause and effect on that level, I'm guessing came pretty easily, you know? It, it, more importantly is that you didn't have like really epic wrong views, like animal sacrifice will lead to liberation. <laughs> you know, like I'm gonna find myself a lamb, I'm gonna get the best lamb and I'm gonna kill it for God and then I'll be an, an enlightened, you know? Um, that might make sense in a certain context. There might even be an argument why that is helpful for a spiritual path. Probably not, but I'm open to the possibility that there might be a context where that's useful. But we, we didn't grow up believing that killing other things for some higher power was going to give us the gift of happiness. Um, we didn't grow up believing that if we whip ourselves, that we could like cleanse ourselves of all of our badness, you know, thank goodness. Right. So, so even if we grew up with ideas like that, maybe part of us never believed it. We thought that seems silly or harmful, or I don't believe in that. 
um, you know, Jewish culture seems a lot healthier than many, you know, you didn't have a strong Southern fundamentalist Christian evangelical scary church <laughs> in your life that was telling you that you had the demon seed or something, you know. Um, and people who grew up that, like that are still, of course, going to become enlightened at some point and still have access to teachings if they want, but their imprints might be such that that worldview makes sense to them. And then it's really hard to break free of. So in that way, very lucky. So, you know... I don't know if you guys feel more comfortable writing me privately about how all, all of this is landing or, you know, if you're kind of getting stuck somewhere, you know, we can talk about it in another forum. If Zoom is too awkward, um, you know, we can write or you can send me um, WhatsApp voice messages or whatever. But um, we're going to shift now to a, just a short meditation. So now we'll shift from developing the power of hearing to developing the powers of reflection and the powers of meditation. So come back to a meditation posture, straight back, alert focus. Revive your motivation. and shifting the mind to reflection and meditation. We meditate on perfect human rebirth in order to make the best use of our perfect human rebirth, in order to shake off any sadness, any depression, any feelings of deprivation. We fill ourselves with the gratitude, with the joy, with the depth of understanding, how very fortunate we are, how very rare these conditions are, allowing the truth of that to fill us so that we make the best of it. And so now we do a comparison, not in order to look down on others, not in order to feel puffed up, not in order to feel pressure or anxiety or expectations, but just a very objective and clear assessment of how very fortunate we are. There are four non-human states with no chance for Dharma study life forms experiencing continual pain and fear, life forms experiencing continual frustration and clinging. So we could call these hell realms 
We could call these hungry ghost realms. Or we could just say a life that is filled with hatred is also a life of pain and fear. And a life filled with addiction is also a life filled with frustration and clinging. And if our minds were consumed by these negative states, we would have no chance to practice, no space, no time, no urge. How bleak our life would be if this was the case. And neither are we animal beings with lives that are full of ignorance, not understanding mortality very clearly, not understanding interconnection except for instinctually, just chasing pleasure, running from potential pain. And neither are we celestial beings or people so flooded with pleasure that it doesn't even occur to them to think of others. So isolated and separate from the pain of other sentient beings. No pathways of empathy, little fuel for compassion. So just thinking how very fortunate we are not to be lost in those states, either literally or metaphorically. And then there are four human situations with no chance for Dharma study. If we were reborn in a society of quote barbarians amongst uncivilized people in a country where religion was outlawed, kill or be killed was the law of the land, aggression and possessiveness driving all decisions of the leadership even though this is the case everywhere in some form, if we were in a specific area where this was nothing but the case, how difficult the spiritual path would be. Or it could be that we live in a place with plenty of kindness and compassionate government policies. We could live in a place full of kind and ethical people, but there might not be access to teachings of an enlightened being where a Buddha hasn't obviously appeared and taught. So without coming across the Buddhist teachings or anything we might consider wisdom or Dharma, we wouldn't have any forward progress but we have met amazing tools in our life. Dharma, psychoanalytic, secular ethics. We've come across trainings and teachings of these things. And then in the older translations, they use inappropriate terminology like mentally retarded, deaf, dumb, and blind. But the point is that people with certain developmental disabilities, people with senses that aren't functioning at their maximum capability, might not be able to process Dharma teachings as easily simply because of access. 
And so just feeling gratitude that so far in our life, these situations are not the case. Because if they were, we might be able to practice Dharma, but it would be that much more challenging. How fortunate we are to have independence. And then we're free of having instinctive wrong views. We're free of superstitious ideas, generally speaking. We don't think that animal sacrifice is going to lead to liberation. We don't think that a mere outer cleansing, like bathing in a certain body of water, is going to inherently purify the mind without any other conditions. So we're free from having these instinctive wrong views, these basic superstitions. If we had them, life would be so much more difficult in terms of progress on the spiritual path. And we would be much more likely to feel victims of circumstance. And so feeling so joyful to have these freedoms, however temporary, however dependently arisen, just amazing that we have these freedoms. Then shifting to think about the endowments or opportunities the five personal ones are similar to before. We were born a human. We live in a central Buddhist region, meaning access to these teachings. We have complete and healthy sense and mental faculties, at least enough for independence and deep thought. We haven't committed any of the five heinous actions which are so damaging that our next rebirth would definitely be lower. And we have faith in the source or an instinctive belief in things worthy of respect. The Dharma, the value of ethics, the path to enlightenment. So these five give us a great personal opportunity to develop our mind. And then we have five endowments or opportunities related to others. We have lived where and when a Buddha has appeared and has taught, and those teachings still exist. We take it for granted. It's so easy to look up things online, to buy books, to go to classes. But this is actually very rare and incredibly precious. And we live where and when there is a Sangha community following the Buddha's teachings. How much more difficult it would be to practice if we didn't have community, if we didn't have others on the path with us. All the collaboration and collective energy we create together, incredibly powerful. So much more momentum than if we practiced alone. And we live where and when there are others with loving concern, patrons or benefactors, teachers. So we have these deep conditions to practice. So allow yourself to feel the profundity of these opportunities or endowments. Try to feel full that we have everything we need inner and outer. Okay, so you can relax your attention. And now we'll do the dedication prayers. <laughs> Ro-wa-ching. 
week.